people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I am your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister's successful tour of India, which was seen as an essential step in advancing the two countries' relationship to the next level. Deputy PM Winston Peters held a productive meeting with India's External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar, discussing cooperation in Commonwealth and the United Nations Security Council reforms. India and New Zealand share warm and friendly relations based on the commonalities of democratic traditions and shared values bolstered by strong people-to-people -people ties. A report. New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters, who was an official visit to India from March 10 to 13, emphasized the significance of India to his country and highlighted the importance of the meetings for strengthening bilateral relations. While lauding the ties between the two nations, Winston said that India's importance to New Zealand's society, economy and security is growing. Winston was on his first visit to India after the new government in New Zealand assumed office in 2023. In New Delhi, Winston held a productive meeting with India's External Affairs Minister S. Jashankar discussing cooperation in Commonwealth and the United Nations Security Council reforms. Taking to the social media platform X, as Jashankar said that both of them agreed on enhancing political and economic relations and people-to-people -people ties. Well, it's been uh, very, very uh, important, very interesting. We think we're making a lot of progress. We went to Gujarat first and now we're in Delhi and uh, talking to uh, key ministers like the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs here. Uh, somebody I've known for some time. So yes, yeah, very important. India is very important to us. The meetings are very important to us too. During his visit to Delhi, Deputy PM Peters also attended the Women's Premier League match between Royal Challengers Bangalore and Mumbai Indians at Arun Jaitley Stadium. At the event, Winston expressed his excitement about women's cricket in India. Well, I think it's very exciting. It's tremendous to see uh, how popular women's cricket is. This is new, but it's happening really fast. And I'm here to watch a New Zealander out there called Divine and score a century here today. But of course you don't have to score a century because you're not chasing that many. And New Zealand players are also playing in this, what do you want to say? Yes, on the other side, uh, well, their score wasn't high enough, but let's, uh, but let's see. We've got to be neutral, there's one New Zealand on each side. Peters concluded a successful tour of India, describing it as an essential step in advancing the two countries' relationship to the next level. Winston Peters also called on the Vice President of India, Jagdeep Dhankar, at the Uprashtpati Nivas. India and New Zealand share warm and friendly relations based on the commonalities of democratic traditions and shared values bolstered by strong people-to-people -people ties. The two countries are engaging in cooperation across a wide range of areas including trade and economy, defense and security, education and research. Bilateral relations were established in 1952 between India and New Zealand. New Zealand has identified India as a priority country in its opening doors to India policy, notified in October 2011, which was reiterated by New Zealand in 2015. Moving on, in a world grappling with the persistent threat of terrorism and religious extremism, Pakistan stands at the centre of attention. 
Pakistan's history is marred by the utilization of religion and terrorism as state policies, profoundly impacting peace in the region. A recent international symposium held in Geneva brought together experts and activists to shed light on the alarming situation unfolding in the South Asian nation. A report. In a symposium held in Geneva, experts and activists gather to illuminate the ongoing issues of terrorism and religious extremism in Pakistan, emphasizing their profound impact on peace in South Asia. As the symposium unfolds, a sobering discussion ensues, delving into the historical utilization of religion and terrorism as a state policies in Pakistan. This dark history has disproportionately affected marginalized communities such as the Pashtuns, Baloch, and Sindhis. They have been striving for independence for decades with Pakistani security forces facing accusations of committing serious human rights abuses in the region. Enforced disappearances in Balochistan have been a long stain on Pakistan's human rights record. Victims of enforced disappearances include political workers, journalists, human rights defenders, and students. Similarly, in Sindh and Pashtun, the Pakistani army held arbitrary arrests, enforced disappearances, torture, extrajudicial killing, and political repression as a tool to silence their voice and struggle. Amidst the discourse, activists stress the urgent need for the international community to take notice and hold Pakistan accountable on a global platform. Fazlur Rahman, president of Khyber Institute, highlighted the historical oppression faced by Pashtuns, Baloch, and Sindhis, attributing it to the use of religion and terrorism as a state policies by Pakistan. As you know, right from the inception of a uh, convoluted state of Pakistan, uh, the religion and terrorism has been used as state policy and tool to oppress and suppress the historical nations of Pakistan, uh, just like uh, Pashtuns, uh, Baloch uh, and Sindhis. And uh, you know about the consistent continuous wars in, in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, in which thousands of innocent Pashtuns and Baloch uh, have been killed and thousands are forcibly disappeared and tortured. Uh, so it's very important for the international community to take notice of the state sponsored terrorism in the region and make the state of Pakistan accountable to the United Nations and the International Court of Justice. Pakistan not only has an abysmal record of human rights, but also the country sponsors cross-border terrorism. Since its formation in 1947, Pakistan has consistently engaged in acts of cross-border terrorism, particularly targeting India. New Delhi has borne the brunt of numerous egregious attacks, all orchestrated and backed by Pakistan. These include the attacks on the Indian parliament in 2001, the 2005 Delhi bombings, the 2008 Mumbai terror attack, as well as assaults on the Pathan Court Air Base and the army camp in Uri, all attributed to Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. Arif Ajakia, a human rights activist, boldly labelled Pakistan as the epicentre of global terrorism and a major purveyor of religious extremism. He urged the international community, notably the United Nations, to take decisive action, proposing the designation of Pakistan's army and ISI as terrorist organizations and the enforcement of sanctions. Pakistan is epicenter of global terrorism and uh, it has always uh, promoted religious extremism in different parts of the world, especially in the neighboring countries of uh, India, Afghanistan, and even recently, Iran also uh, attacked uh, by missiles in Pakistan targeting a religious uh, extremist outfit created by uh, the mother of all terrorism, 
inter services intelligence isi of pakistan i would uh, convey my message to the international authorities especially united nations that pakistan army and its notorious intelligence agency isi should be declared terrorist groups they should be uh, pakistan should be uh, sanctioned embargo should be imposed and all the serving and retired pakistan army officers should be brought to international court of justice for war crime tribunal and should be punished as war criminals as the symposium draws to a close the glaring reality of pakistan's complicity in sponsoring terrorism and nurturing extremism casts a long shadow over the international community the evidence presented leaves no room for doubt pakistan's fingerprints are all over some of the most heinous acts of violence and terror witnessed in recent history time now for asia this week the stories from across the continent Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi witnessed strike services exercise performed collectively by Indian Navy, Army and Air Force in northwestern Jaisalmer on March 12th. Joint Army personnel from the subdivisions were seen performing battle drills in Pokhran firing field to showcase their defense capabilities to Prime Minister Modi. Prime Minister Modi hailed the success of Bharat Shakti or made in india over the last decade and also announced the domestic designing development and manufacturing of fifth generation fighter aircrafts in india humne desh ko raksha kshetra mein atmanirbhar banane ke liye ek ke baad ek bade kadam uthaye hain fifth generation ladakh viman bhi हम भारत में ही डिजाइन डेवलप और मैन्युफैक्चर करने वाले हैं に望んでた町に待ったあの意見判決が出て今すっごく嬉しい気持ちです。えっとこれまであの多くの方がこの訴訟に協力してくださったおかげで出た判決だとも思っております。Narendra Modi laid the foundation stones for three semiconductor facilities in India marking a significant step towards the country's goal of becoming a semiconductor manufacturing hub 
in recent times, there has been a significant increase in the demand for semiconductors due to various factors, including the growing acceptance of 5G technology, the increasing demand for processing units due to cryptocurrency mining, and the government's ongoing efforts towards digitalization. Take a look. जो नीतियां बना रहा है उसका भी हमें स्ट्रेटेजिक एडवांटेज मिले the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, on March 13th addressed India's decade, chips for Vixit Bharat program, and laid the foundation stone for three semiconductor projects worth about rupees 1.25 lakh crores via video conferencing. The foundation stone was laid for three crucial projects the semiconductor fabrication facility at the Doleda Special Investment Region. DSIR Gujarat, Outsourced Semiconductor Assembly and Test, OSAT Facilities at Morigaon in Assam and Sanand in Gujarat. While addressing the youth across the country on the occasion, PM said that Made in India Semiconductor Chips will take the country towards self-reliance and modernity. सेमीकंडक्टर मैन्युफैक्चरिंग का एक बड़ा ग्लोबल हब बनाने में मदद करेगी मैं सभी देशवासियों को इस महत्वपूर्ण पहल के लिए ये महत्वपूर्ण शुरुआत के लिए एक मजबूत कदम के लिए Recognizing the significance of the semiconductor industry, the Indian government has implemented various measures and policies. In December 2021, the government committed an impressive rupees 76,000 crores, that is 10 billion US dollars to catalyze the semiconductor manufacturing ecosystem in India. In July last year, Semicon India Conference 2023 was organized in Gujarat's Gandhinagar, which proved to be a success as leaders of the industry hailed India's vision in this sector. The theme of the Semicon India Conference 2023 was catalyzing India's semiconductor ecosystem. PM Narendra Modi had invited global semiconductor majors to take first movers advantage and invest in India. The conclave witnessed participation of major companies such as Micron Technology, Applied Materials, Foscon, SEMI, AMD among others. It has been the Prime Minister's vision to position India as a global hub for semiconductor design manufacturing and technology development, fostering the creation of employment opportunities for the nation's youth. We started a semi-conductor mission for two years ago. We started to take initiatives. In this month, we signed our first MOUs. और आज सिर्फ कुछ महीनों के भीतर हम तीन प्रदेश का सिलान्यास कर रहे हैं। इंडिया कमिट्स, इंडिया डिलीवर्स एंड डेमोक्रेसी डिलीवर्स। In recent times, there has been a significant increase in the demand for semiconductors due to various factors including the growing acceptance of 5G technology, the increasing demand for processing units due to cryptocurrency mining and the government's ongoing efforts towards digitalization. With its population of over 1.4 billion and robust education system, India has the potential to become a talent powerhouse in the semiconductor industry and help ease the severe shortage of skilled professionals.
The Hindu festival Mahashivratri was recently celebrated with great fervor in Gaiti with devotees keeping fast and offering prayers to Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati commemorating the merging of masculine and feminine energy essential for creation and balance in the universe through taking out religious processions and recreating their marriage take a look As the soul-stirring sankhanat and the rhythmic beating of dhamru bells resonated the hearts and minds of people with devotion, every corner of Bharat echoed with the chants of Har Har Mahadev in unison. Har Har After all, the most awaited Mahashivratri festival, often considered the great night of Shiva, was here. The Indian festival Mahashivratri holds great significance in Hindu religion as the marriage of Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati symbolizes the merging of masculine and feminine energies essential for creation and balance in the universe. Mahashivratri is annually observed on the 14th day of the dark fortnight in the Hindu month of people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect